Good morning, everyone from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. We're welcoming you to our seventh annual patient conference for the Canadian MPN Network. I will be your host today, and my name is Cheryl Petrick. I'm looking forward to navigating you through a couple of hours of two speakers that we brought for you uh, within the MPN community and um, to provide you an update on the Canadian MPN Network and what we're doing here in Canada to help our patient community. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen and provide you with an overview of what the Canadian MPN Network has been doing over the past year. So as we know, September is Blood Cancer Awareness Month and the Canadian MPN Network has been busy um, doing things to promote the MPN Blood, uh, blood cancer awareness for our organization and for the Canadian community. One of the things that I'd like to just share with you before we move on any further into our conference is that all our participants are in mute only mode. So if you do have a question, please utilize the Q&A or the chat functionality and we'll be glad to ha and happy to answer any of the questions that you might pose to us. That also goes for our speakers as well as um, we will have the questions posted afterwards on our website. So the Canadian MPN Network is the patient advocacy group here in Canada that supports myeloproliferative neoplasm blood cancers such as ET, essential thrombocythemia, myelofibrosis, and polysthemia vera. This is our seventh annual patient conference, and today's conference presenters will be Dr. Naveen Pemaraju, a hematologist and oncologist from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. He's the Associate Professor, Department of Leukemia at the University of Texas, and Dr. Cy Shireen Sirhan, hematologist, oncologist at Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, Qu Quebec, and she's also the Assistant Professor at McGill University. So who is the Canadian MPN Network? Well, we are a patient organization of volunteers who are committed to improving the lives of Canadians living with myeloproliferative neoplasms. We do this through patient advocacy, patient support groups, and patient communication. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Board of Directors. Our Chair is Joanne McKinley. Our Vice Chair is Dove Lador. Our treasurer, Phil Arner, and members at large are Doug Chisholm, Johnny Eastley, Charles Kent, Kristen Hummel, Augusto Lagate, and Catherine Picard. Our advocacy committee, the chair of that committee is John Clark, and members are Johnny Eastley, Patty Salak, Marie Granny Davis, Charles Kent, and Lynn McGrath. At this time, I'd like to introduce Doug Chisholm, who will introduce and talk a little bit about the patient support groups across Canada. Doug, I'll leave it to you to take it away and talk about the support groups. Good morning, everybody, from uh, Calgary, Alberta, where we're just having breakfast out here. Um, but it's great to join with everybody across Canada. Our goal certainly is to be a network of uh, support groups, Facebook groups, and uh, patients and care partners all the way across Canada. I wanted to give you just a brief outline um, of who uh, is leading and, and the culture a little bit and uh, what support groups and Facebook groups we do have across Canada. And I'm gonna start on the West Coast. Uh, Mark Williams, anybody that's had a chance to interact with Mark on, in BC, uh, knows him to be a warm and compassionate, a well-informed uh, leader, and uh, everybody just speaks volumes about his character. And he has a vibrant group of patients from all over BC, from the greater Vancouver area, from Vancouver Island, from the Okanagan, from the interior of BC. And Mark is one of the founding members of the Canadian MPN Network, and certainly has a vision for keeping us connected all the way across Canada into truly a patient support network, former board member as well. As we move into Alberta, uh, Northern Alberta is Patty Saluk, and she 
is based in Edmonton, but she looks after everything from Red Deer all the way up north to the border there. And uh, Patty uh, has been with us just about a year. Uh, she looks after big cities like Edmonton and Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie. Uh, when you ask Patty why she's involved, she talks about things like quality of life and support and comfort. She said when she first got diagnosed, she was felt alone and defeated. There was no literature, no support. And so she wanted to do something about that. And she brings up a really important point for our support groups. And that is that she wants to support the hematologists uh, in her area. And that's one of the goals of our support groups is to work with our hematologists and to make sure that we're accountable to them, that we learn from them and that we take good care of their patients. As we move into Southern Alberta, uh, that's where my wife Catherine and I look after the MPN Southern Alberta group. We look after Red Deer south to the Canadian US border and cities like Calgary and Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. Uh, we have about 30 patients locally and about 10 patients we support remotely. And of course they're care partners because care partners are just as important to our support groups as the patients are. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're supporting them too. Uh, this group started in 2018 uh, with the goal of providing factual, relevant, up-to-date information on MPNs, because you all know what it's like to go on the internet and how uh, inaccurate it is about many things, and also to journey together. And our two sponsoring doctors from the Tom Baker Cancer Center um, were the Canadian MPN Champion Award winners in 2020. So we're, we're really um, privileged to have them. There's a new group that's just started up in Saskatchewan. It's a Facebook group only. Allison Sander uh, is the administrator of that group. And it's got about a dozen patients based uh, not only in Regina and Saskatoon, but starting to be all over Saskatchewan. The goal there was to provide a sense of community. And uh, we support it from Southern Alberta for our meetings and that type of thing. But uh, Allison's got a real vibrant Facebook group going there. And you can find any of these Facebook groups, for example, hers by going onto Facebook and searching for MPN Saskatchewan. In Manitoba, Jean Reed has been with us for a couple of years. And uh, Jean started a support group and found that a Facebook group is working a little bit better for her out there. And it's available for anybody in the province of Manitoba to join. Uh, most of the patients she speaks to are from the Winnipeg area. Uh, Jean says she remembers her total despair when she was diagnosed. There was no leaflet. There was no information available for her at a clinic. She Googled different areas, but needed some good information and found the Canadian MPN network group. And she just wants people not to be alone in their diagnosis. So that's Jean Reed in Manitoba. Once we get into Ontario, there's uh, several groups that are available to us. Uh, MPN Ontario is run by uh, Maureen Grenier Davis, uh, Joanne McKinley, who is our board chair, and John Clark. Uh, Marie and John are former board members as well, so well involved in the organization. Uh, they started in 2012, so they've been around quite a long time. They meet in the Hamilton area when it's safe to do so. And of course, just like the rest of us, they're on Zoom in the meantime. And they want to offer a safe and secure environment where patient and care partners uh, can get good information and experience a sense of community because they understand completely what it's like to feel frightened when they first get diagnosed and how much of a positive difference having good information can be. And just as I uh, talk about that group, I do want to underline John Clark. John does a tremendous amount of work with our support groups across Canada. Uh, staying in touch with them, mentoring, and uh, giving good leadership to our support groups across Canada. We've got a new group in Barrie, uh, Kristen Hummel and Cindy Buckley. Kristen's on the board. Uh, they carry the, they're covering the Barrie area for right now, but they're hoping to uh, expand into the Muskoka area and down into South Simcoe County in the future. And um, they also want to provide that up-to-date information, so important to patients and care partners and to do everything they can to improve the quality of life for those that are journeying with an MPN. That's the Barry area. There's another one in, in Ottawa. And Charlie Kent and Phil Arner are both board members. And they look after Ottawa and Eastern Ontario. And uh, 
they were set up to support a local hematologist at the Ottawa hospital uh, and, and that doctor's patients. And it's evolved into what is turning out to be a really nice uh, growing uh, support group uh, that has lots of good relevant information for people in the Ottawa and Eastern Ontario area. As we get into Quebec, Augusto Laude and Catherine Picard are both board members and they cover the entire uh, Quebec area. Um, they wanted to get some good access to information in French for their uh, care partners and their patients in that area. And people could then understand what it's like to live with an MPN and get a better quality of life. So they've been building up a community of patients and caregivers, a real family environment to uh, support and encourage each other. And uh, they feel like patient advocacy is an important part of, um, of their support group activities. And then lastly, on the East Coast, a new group uh, headed up by Steve Evans, who's one of our board members and Roseanne Bryant. And they cover all the Atlantic provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI and Newfoundland. And uh, they're hoping to have their first online meeting later this month. So if you're interested in information about them, all of these support groups can be reached at Atlantic at Canadian MPN Network, Southern Alberta at Canadian MPN Network uh, and a good way to get in touch either that way or onto our Canadian MPN Network Facebook page. We can put you in touch that way too. So that's just a bit of an overview of what's happening in Canada with a growing number of patient support groups and Facebook groups. Thanks, Cheryl, back to you. Thanks, Doug. It was great to hear about our support groups and all that they're doing. Um, I can tell you that I know uh, each of our support group leaders personally, having worked with them over the many years, and we have a very dedicated group of people involved in providing the support to our MPN patients across the country. If you're encouraged or want to get involved with any of the support groups, please reach out to them. Look to our website, the Canadian www.canadianmpnnetwork.ca for um, more information on how you can get in touch with the support groups or if you just like to even um, go to a support group meeting. Unfortunately, right now during our COVID-19 pandemic, most of our support group meetings are virtual uh, by utilization of Zoom, but certainly at one point, I hope that we will be able to get back in person. I know that is the hope of each and every one of our support group leaders, but please do reach out if you would like to talk with someone or you'd like some more information about the local support group in your area. So the growth of the Canadian MPN network, as Doug had just mentioned, that our organization was founded as a not-for-profit group in 2014. And support groups um, have come up and we have leaders from all across Canada. Again, here is the listing of all of our support groups and the emails for each of those support groups. And of course, this is listed on our website. Of course, we have a very robust website and we'd love to see you um, visit our website for more information about MPN blood cancers or anything that the Canadian MPN Network is doing. So please do visit the website um, at your leisure. Transitioning now to the Canadian MPN Research Foundation, the Canadian MPN Research Foundation has been established to stimulate and, fu and fund new and ongoing research projects in Canada for MPN blood cancers. We have a very special announcement that we will be um, that we'd like to introduce our latest project, and that is a quality of life patient tracking tool app. So the Canadian MPN Research Foundation will roll out in November of 2021, the MPN Genie. This is a quality of life patient tracking tool app for your smartphone or tablet, where patients can track their quality of life and share information directly with their MPN physician. 
The Canadian MPN Research Foundation has three wishes, just like our genie, to help assist and educate our patients, our MPN, MPN physicians, and research community. So be prepared to watch for November for the official rollout with our webinars from the Canadian MPN Research Foundation and your MPN physician. So you can look at more information on the Canadian MPN uh, Research Foundation at www.cmpnrf.ca. Here you can make a donation and invest in the future of new and ongoing treatments in Canada. At this time, we'd like to take some thank yous. We have a special thank you going out to our two speakers, Dr. Naveen Pemaraju and Dr. Shireen Sirhan. The Canadian MPN Network Conference Committee, Dove Lador, Marilyn Lador, Joanne McKinley and Steve Evans, and to John Clark for the registration. And we'd also like to thank our sponsor uh, of Novartis for their time and uh, help in putting our conference together. So thank you very much to our uh, to our stakeholder Novartis. So mm -hmm. now I'm going to have Joanne um, Joanne McKinley, our chair of the Canadian MPN Network, introduce you. So Joanne, go ahead and introduce our next speaker. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Naveen Pamaraji an associate professor in the Department of Leukemia, Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas, MD Anderson Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Pemaraju received his medical degree in medical science from the University of Arkansas. He completed his internal medicine training at the Osler Medical Program at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, followed by a fellowship in hematology and oncology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Pemaraju's clinical and research work focuses on improving outcomes and developing novel therapies and clinical trials for patients with AML, CML, BPDCN, and myeloproliferative neoplasms, um, and for several national clinical trials in MPNs. He has helped develop novel targeted therapies for these patients. You may also have seen Dr. Pemaraji as a guest on Patient Power. It is my pleasure to introduce him. Wow, thank you guys uh, so much for that warm uh, introduction. Uh, it's my honor to be here with the Canadian MPN Network, my friends and colleagues, and a particular shout out to my friend and colleague, Dr. Vikas Gupta, uh, who has done so much advocacy, not only uh, in Canada, but across the world for our patients with MPN. So this is a great honor for me. So team, if it's okay for the next uh, half an hour or so, I'd like to uh, show you some work uh, around the world in the area that's very near and dear to your hearts, which is the patient journey, the patient experience with MPNs. And so trying to give this information in a mixed audience setting. I think, guys, it starts with Sir William, uh, with William Damashak. Uh, he was the very first person uh, in the United States who really started thinking about our MPNs in a very serious way. And what Damashak said in the uh, 50s is that it is possible that these various conditions, of course, then known as myeloproliferative disorders, are all variable manifestations of proliferative activity of the bone marrow cells perhaps due to a hitherto undiscovered stimulus. How right he was. This is before DNA double helix. This is before JAK2, CalR, MIPL. Uh, so of course, these proved to be very prophetic words. So as we think about MPDs, right, we used to call uh, these disorders, and of course, now we call them MPNs together, neoplasms. Our colleague and friend, Dr. Ruben Mesa, has this nice graphic that he lent to me. Let's take a look at it. For th those of you out there, who have the earlier stages, polycythemia vera and ET, you know, and your caregivers know, those aren't so benign indolent diseases. Patients with these diseases can have a significant MPN burden, significant symptoms, and even mortality in these early stages. Usually we think of uh, vascular events, so either bleeding or clotting as the biggest factors that affect your quality of life. But of course, you guys out there know this, bone pain, fatigue, itching, there's so many other things going on 
uh, when you really ask your MPN patient what's going on there. Now, the problem with MPNs is that in the chronic phase, that's okay, fine, but then the disease can become much more acute, and, and we call that myelofibrosis, as you all know. Here, the progressive constitutional symptoms are devastating. Cachexia, weight loss, patients often, quote, look like they are ill to the outside world. Uh, the organs are getting bigger, spleen and liver, which then cause worse symptoms. And then, of course, cytopenias. That means anemia, thrombocytopenia, so low blood counts. That can also then make your symptoms worse because now you need transfusions. You're tired all the time, short of breath. Unfortunately, now for our patients, uh, life expectancy is very low at this point, measured only in years and months, and can, of course, lead to the dreaded AML leukemic transformation, which is a poor prognosis state overall. So where do we begin thinking about the patient journey and symptoms? Well, as I put together this talk, what I thought I would share with you is show you that even ET and PV are not, as some people regard them as, quote, benign diseases. These are still malignant cancers that can cause really bad symptoms for our patients. Take a look at ET. So in terms of overall survival, our Italian colleagues, Professor Passamonti, really done the great long-term studies confirming that overall the ET patient survival is effectively the same as the general population, so that's fine, but that the leukemia risk is higher than the general population, myelofibrosis risk, and of course, some of the therapies that we give can lead to decreased symptom burden. And so the concept is if you're diagnosed with ET at a young age, you may be living with this for many, many decades and have lots of problems as you go along. So then we give patients these therapies. We really only have a few in the frontline setting, hydroxyurea and pegylated interferon, both with their own set of side effects. And hydroxyurea itself is not only as, uh, associated with resistance, but also people can have intolerance, uh, skin lesions, fevers, uh, mouth sores, ulcers. Hydroxyurea is not a benign drug for patients. And so the concept here is that we need many more therapies. And so the therapies themselves can then contribute to worsen quality of life. The Pegasus interferon, of course, having great effects on the disease modification, but can lead to autoimmune conditions like thyroid, mental health conditions like depression, even suicide in some patients getting Pegasus interferon. So the, the therapies we offer themselves can have side effects. When I think about ET, the other concept here is that most of our patients will be on a baby aspirin. So you have to be looking out for bleeding while you're trying to prevent clotting there. Um, as I turn to polycythemia vera, the old model, this is a, a painting that hangs in my own office given to me by my mentors, Dr. Jerry Spivak and Allison Moliterno at Johns Hopkins. This is one of Sir William Osler's patients who has classic PV. This is the older male with the ruddy facies clutching the chest with chest pain because of hyperviscosity. This is a textbook model. Most of our patients nowadays that are being diagnosed are younger folks, uh, male and female equally, people being diagnosed at the time of pregnancy or a surgery, people being diagnosed because of a routine blood exam. So it's completely different and people's symptoms are, are quite different. One of the most important things if you have PV is that you may be feeling fine, but secretly you have a high risk of cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke compared to the general population at your same age. And this was the definitive study done by the Italian group, New England Journal, 2013, which showed two different groups of PV patients. The only thing that was randomized, guys, was phlebotomies. One group got rigorous phlebotomies to keep the hematocrit below 45. This is regardless of symptoms. The other one got phlebotomies not as rigorous, and the rigorous group had a four-fold decrease in cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The translation is, even if you're not feeling symptoms with P. vera, you still can have a deadly condition without knowing about it. So exercise, if you can do it, weight loss, cardiovascular health, having a regular doctor, talking to your PV and ET doctor about the disease, managing clot burden, stopping smoking. My goodness, there's a lot to talk about with quality of life in these diseases. And so the same problem with ET is there for PV. We don't have many choices to treat you with. Hydroxyurea with its attendant side effects, uh, interferon with its attendant side effects. I am hopeful because there's several new clinical trial drugs that are in active phase of discovery for our patients. And again, a lot of you out there may have lower risk disease, so you may not need some of these uh, drugs. Usually it's over the age of 60 or a prior blood clot that usually uh, tips the balance to needing these therapies. So the concept from PV and ET, the diseases themselves can elaborate 
decrease quality of life. We need to be on lookout for that. The therapies themselves can do it. And then your other comorbidities or other issues going on, all of it can lead to problems, sleeping, fatigue, all of these important issues. I mentioned hydroxyurea. This is the most commonly prescribed drug, not a benign drug. It's been around for a long time, used in benign and malignant conditions, sickle cell anemia, P. vera ET. But when you look at side effects, people do have low-grade side effects, fevers, what we call mucosal cutaneous, basically ulcers in different parts of the body, mouth, legs. And so you really need to be watching out for it. And some of you out there just can't take this drug and that's called intolerance. Well, this has biological implications. For those of you out there who have PV, whether you're resistant or intolerant to hydroxyurea, that's not good news because studies find that if you can't get along with that one medicine, you may be at a much higher risk of transforming to leukemia and even having poor outcomes. And so urgent therapies are needed that are not only better tolerated, but can improve the symptom burden from the baseline. One such agent is the ruxolitinib agent, which you know from myelofibrosis. Ruxolitinib was tested in a phase three trial for PVERA. Remember, that's a large clinical trial where you have two groups, the ruxolitinib or Jacophy at 10 twice a day, uh, compared to what's called BAT, best available therapy, and patients were allowed to cross over to the ruxolitinib. The primary endpoint was, can this reduce the amount of phlebotomies and can it bring the spleens down with secondary uh, outcomes, of course, for the symptom burden, which is the subject of our talk today. Very nicely, uh, the ruxolitinib was significantly better than the best available therapy, and this gained US FDA approval for patients who are either intolerant or resistant to hydrea. And again, it's where our MPN field leads many other cancer fields where intolerance, so the patient reported outcome or PRO is essential to the package label insert. MPNs, our field generally leads that uh, category of, of that designation. Well, what about myelofibrosis? Well, we'll spend the rest of our morning together. Unfortunately, many of you out there who have myelofibrosis know that this can be a deadly disease. So some patients low risk can be measured in decades, but if you're intermediate to higher risk, this can be an aggressive disease leading to very large spleen and liver, uh, sick feeling, mo a lot of transfusions, transformation leukemia, early death. So this is a very, very serious condition to have. Make no mistake, this is a blood cancer for a formidable blood cancer in and of itself. Well, I was charged to talk about symptom burden. This is really where I think not only our field has been a breakthrough, but has really helped all the other cancer fields too. I'd like to give a shout out to our friend and colleague, Dr. Ruben Mesa, who his group um, really pioneered and discovered and created the MPN symptom burden questionnaire that many of you have filled out and actually is included in every single one of our clinical trials remarkably, and this has been translated into many languages. Dr. Mesa is now the president of the UT San Antonio MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. So his pioneering work team really said that we should be able to quantify the unquantifiable to make subjective symptoms objective. So you see your MPN doctor, you have a bunch of symptoms. Usually we just write them down, okay, and then see you the next visit. What Mesa said is, is, why don't we put it to a score? That way it's reproducible, it's reportable, you can actually follow a number, and then if we do clinical trials, we can actually see if these drugs are working. It's actually genius. Uh, the system has changed over time. Many of you are familiar with the latest version, which is essentially called the MPN TSS or Total Symptom Score. Basically 10 major factors, let's go through them. But by far the most common symptom most of our patients have, as you know, is fatigue, fatigue from the diseases themselves, PV, ET, MF, early satiety and abdominal discomfort, usually from hepatosplenomegaly, inactivity, concentration problems, night sweats, uh, itching or pruritus, bone pain, fever, and weight loss. So yikes, these are symptoms that kind of are all over the place. Peripheral neuropathy, some of you have out there, this can be your MPN itself. So what MESA has shown us is we can quantify it at baseline and at follow-up so you can see if your drug is working or not. Huge breakthrough in our field. So let's see how it was applied. The first real place where this was really applied was with the pioneering studies that led to ruxolitinib being FDA approved for myelofibrosis. This was led uh, in part by Dr. Verstovsek at here at MD Anderson, Dr. MESA, Dr. Vikas Gupta uh, of the MPN Canadian Network very important contributions by our Canadian colleagues and patients. And these are the so-called comfort one and two studies. And before that, the earlier studies with ruxolitinib. And 
this is very important. What this drug showed us is that taking a pill twice a day not only yielded benefit to the patients in terms of reduction in spleen size, which was the primary endpoint, but also improvement in these symptoms. This is the breakthrough part of this finding. Improvement in symptoms, fatigue, night sweats, bone pain. We had patients who were in wheelchairs who were able to get out of wheelchairs within weeks of getting this therapy. Spleens that were shrinking, livers that were shrinking, people having more energy than ever before. And then now the five-year overall survival data has, out, has been out and patients who have the ruxolitinib versus not with intermediate to high-risk MF have overall survival benefit. This was the breakthrough in our field that a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor given by mouth can not only improve spleen, but it can improve the symptom burden of our patients with MPN. And so as you might imagine with such a breakthrough story, this gained FDA approval. It was the first targeted therapy approved in myelofibrosis reduction of the spleen and symptom burden as built-in endpoints, prospective built-in endpoints into the study. It met both of those. And then later on, five years later, showing the overall survival benefit. Really, really important. PRO, patient reported outcomes like this, quality of life, helped to guide the initial drug development and does so 10 years later. Amazing. Well, even though these JAK inhibitors have been a breakthrough, they don't cure the disease. The only cure is still allogeneic stem cell transplant. And again, your group, Dr. Vikas Gupta and others are a huge transplant center who have shown these repeatedly. But you guys know the problem with stem cell transplant is it can be deadly in and of itself, have toxicities, graft versus host disease, and you really have to be younger and fitter to go for it. I think the evolving area here is, can we transplant safely older patients with some comorbidities? Can we change up the donor types and the intensity of the conditioning? And then, of course, what's the quality of life in our patients post-transplant? What about um, in terms of one year after, two years after, five years after? So many groups around the world are looking into that. So it could be that your MPN is, you have a different quality of life burden before and after the transplant because the transplant itself has its own toxicity. So a curative approach, no doubt, for the select high-risk younger patient, but then comes with its own baggage, if you will, with MPN symptom burden and other toxicities. So what do you get out of all this so far? Well, what I think is you have a class of drugs now, the JAK inhibitors, you have the ruxolitinib agent, which was first in class, which in addition to being approved in myelofibrosis and intolerant or resistant P. vera, as I showed you, also now has an approval for acute graft versus host disease. You have to monitor for the patient's quality of life before and after drugs, Look out for infections. Patients with myelofibrosis and sometimes with treatments can have higher rates of infections like shingles, herpes, zoster. And then you have to always be looking out for skin cancers, non-melanoma, squamous, and basal cell. So I usually recommend that our patients see a dermatologist at some point in their uh, myelofibrosis journey. And then, you know, if you qualify for these shingrix and, and vaccines, talk to your local doctor for that. There's a second FDA-approved drug now in the U.S. called fedratinib or INREBEC, which is also approved for myelofibrosis, intermediate to high risk, broad indication. And you have to monitor, again, quality of life is important. There was some signal for what's called encephalopathy syndrome. So some problems uh, with the brain and thinking that um, possibly is linked to vitamin deficiency, such as uh, vitamin B thiamine. So you need to know, you need to check that level, follow that in your patients. Incidentally, this can be low in other groups of uh, older patients or frail. So uh, look out for GI toxicity, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So interesting, hand in hand with drug development must be consideration of the quality of life. And then there's many other JAK inhibitors, pecritinib, momolotinib in, in phase three clinical trials. I'll show you some data there. The key that I think you'll all be pleased to know is that quality of life, MPN symptom burden is built into all of these trials. So it's something that's just part of our field. And I hope other cancer fields will adopt this. So as we think about the future, a lot of hope a lot of optimism. Besides the ruxolitinib and fedratinib, there's these two other drugs I mentioned, pacritinib and momolotinib. And we're starting to see where maybe we can think about giving these drugs to patients. The pacritinib agent in particular has shown nice benefit in people with very low platelets. So those of you who have thrombocytopenia, you have increased risk of bleeding, this agent has particularly been tested in that setting. So that might be a nice option. Those of you who need frequent red blood cell transfusion, sometimes some of the other JAK inhibitors make that get worse in the beginning. The momolotinib has shown some activity that that may help there. 
so on and so forth. So it's really amazing to see our field burgeoning like this. And then I'll show you some data at the end of the talk where we're adding second drugs to the JAK inhibitor that may help some of these signals and then completely beyond JAK inhibitor new agents. So pecritinib we mentioned is this JAK inhibitor in still FDA um, in the clinical trials prior to FDA approval. It also hits some other targets. And this agent has been checked in the PERSIST 1 and 2 study and now in the phase 3 Pacifica trial. This is just one data set from one of the earlier trials of PERSIST 1, which clearly showed that you have a good proportion of patients achieving what's called the TSS reduction 50, so 50% reduction in the symptom burden as compared to best available therapy, as you can see here, and that's regardless of the patient's platelets. Um, and so you have a nice significant burden here. So with JAK inhibitors, not only check to see if it's reducing the spleen, but also if it's improving your, uh, the patient's symptoms. Uh, my colleague, and that data was from Don, Dr. John Moscarenas and colleagues. Next is my colleague, Dr. Claire Harrison, uh, who showed data recently at the EHA meeting this year on the Jakarta 1 and 2 trials. This is the agent Fedratinib. And again, same trend here that this agent, which is already approved in the US, is decreasing spleens and improving symptom burden as well. So this appears to be a, a good class effect of JAK inhibitors. I mentioned the momolotinib agent. This was shown by Dr. Mesa uh, and Dr. Verstovsic also at the EHA meeting. Let's take a look at that data. The key here is that this drug hits some other targets besides JAK, and that may help people's anemia. And that's through uh, a pathway called hepcidin and mini hepcidin, so iron balance levels. So the background of this drug is that anemia and transfusion dependence is really one of the worst things for many of you out there. It's one of the dreaded parts of this disease. And that if you can get a control of that, then you may improve the overall survival of your patient with MF. And that's in fact what they showed in this presentation, that if you get this momolotinib agent and have the benefit, which is converting from TD, transfusion dependence, to TI, transfusion independence, that you then can improve your overall survival signal. So basically, uh, an agent that may help in one of the more tough uh, to treat areas of myelofibrosis and therefore improving your quality of life by reducing fatigue, shortness of breath, bleeding. Very exciting and hopeful part for all of us in the field and for the patients and caregivers is now the clinical trials are moving to doublet and triplet therapy. Uh, here's a sampling of them, but in a good way, this is increasing month by month. Our group at the MD Anderson has helped to pioneer combining with hypomethylator agents for patients with MF, azacitidine and D-cytobine. We're testing a number of different options in clinical trials, heat shock inhibition, BCLXL with the nevitoclax, PI3 kinase, thalidomide, the list goes on and on. The concept here is that we went from single agent to now offering people two drugs. Of course, the theme here is that when you add in a second drug, what is the new toxicity that you're adding? Now, some of you unfortunately may not respond to this frontline approach, and now you need a second line therapy. Unfortunately, there's no FDA approved therapy. So that's why myself, Dr. Gupta, others are still working day and night, seven days a week to try to find new therapies. Uh, here's a list of some of those uh, novel therapies here. And I think the concept is, you know, you know, a lot of these are letters and numbers, but there's different areas of the myelofibrosis. So the cancer cells themselves, the area around the bone marrow, the microenvironment, the cell pathways that lead to cell death, the fibrosis itself, we're looking into all of these. Let me look, let me review some of these and show you where symptom burden falls in here. It's actually kind of cool and interesting. So the first such add-on study is the Ruxolidin plus Nevitoclax data set, which, was, uh, which is being led by myself and my colleague, Dr. Claire Harrison from the UK. And what we've shown in a couple of our meetings now is that combining this agent, it's a new drug, it's not yet FDA approved, BCL XL inhibition. So one of these pathways in these cancer cells, specifically in myelofibrosis. So a pill chemo, just like Rux. But the concept here is that in the lab, if you combine these two pills, it appears that it uh, is synergistic effect. So better than just either one alone. And so we're doing ongoing clinical trials here, phase two study where we added, and now it's into the phase three called the transform one and two studies. This was data that I showed publicly uh, almost a year ago, where in the first 34 patients, we achieved not only spleen volume reduction, these are patients who've already been on RUCS, by the way, and not yet having full response, so-called suboptimal responders. And then they also are having TSS 50, the symptom burden 50%, 
in 30% of the patients. So these are not frontline patients. They've already been on RUCs for three months or longer. We're also starting to see possibly some signals for bone marrow fibrosis improvements, cytokine improvements with a fairly well-managed toxicity profile where you're looking for drop in the platelets in almost everybody and GI side effects, but very manageable uh, in these clinical trials. The second promising uh, program is that of adding the BET inhibitor bromodomain from consolation in the so-called manifest study. In this exactly the same design, you're already on the ruxolitinib, you add in the second agent. Again, a novel mechanism of action, something different than JAK-STAT. Here, the new drug bromodomain BET inhibitor looks like it may suppress this high cytokine burden, which may help you feel better, promote healthy cells from being made and, and trying to kill the cancer cells. And again, in this manifest study, in addition to spleen volume reduction, they saw early on that you do have symptom burden improvement in many of the patients. Um, and then that can also lead to improvements in transfusion needs and all of that. So very, very promising. This is also going into the phase three testing. Still more drugs. Uh, this is another study that uh, I led with my colleagues uh, called Tegraxafus, which hits a target called CD123 in patients with myelofibrosis on a clinical trial. And this drug, we were able to lead to FDA approval in a very rare leukemia known as BPDCN. So how about the early going here? Again, same theme that even in, these are patients who've already failed. They've already had a frontline therapy, most of whom had a JAK inhibitor or some other therapy. And now they're in the relapse setting looking for a clinical trial drug. Again, as you can see, you see many patients who do have stable disease, some having spleen reduction, some having this total symptom score, TSS symptom burden benefit on the right. And then one more drug to discuss is a novel agent called LCL-161. This is a SMAC mimetic. Uh, it's a pro-apoptotic drug. So trying to promote myelofibrosis cell death. Uh, and we led this study here at the MD Anderson and recently published this last month in Blood Advances, uh, which is available publicly. You can look that up. This is an oral weekly pill just to show you a different novel mechanism. Again, the concept here is many patients who've already had a JAK inhibitor or other therapy now need some other new pathway something else to try to kill the myelofibrosis cells. And we know that our patients have a high cytokine burden, which means the cancer is making you feel bad. So can we crush that, makes you feel better, shrinks the spleen, helps you to live longer. That was the rationale here. And in the early going, we did see that. We saw several patients having this symptom benefit, uh, which is rigorous, actually. It's defined in our response criteria, several patients having anemia benefits, so on and so forth. And so the, the bottom line from this agent, an oral weekly agent, it showed some modest but encouraging activity in this phase two trial. And of course, it'll be interesting to see if this agent or other agents like this can be combined or, or move on into further drug therapies. So as I conclude my remarks, I think about two factors. We conducted a survey recently that was published uh, this year showing that what we talk about as doctors is often disconnected from what you as patients and caregivers care about. And you know that even this talk here, I showed a lot of data and numbers, but I think what matters to me, because I'm also a clinician, I, I see patients every week in the clinic, how are you doing? The numbers sometimes don't explain how the MPN is doing. So we need to reach out. One way uh, that we're doing is through Twitter and social media. And if you can believe it, I myself got Dr. Vikas Gupta on Twitter, ask him, he'll tell you that. And he and I co-founded with several of our colleagues, Dr. Mike Thompson and Dr. Mesa, this hashtag MPNSM. Any of you can find us on there. Hashtag is category on Twitter, neoplasm on social media, MPNSM. It's an organic conversation. It's just us on there talking to each other reach out. You don't want to do specific patient questions, right, guys? That's better for the clinic and, and a formal discussion, but general topics, what's going on at meetings, what's going on with journal articles. At first, when we launched this, there were crickets. Nobody cared about it. But then when the ASH meeting happened later that year, this is 2014 into 15, we saw a skyrocketing of patients, caregivers, advocates uh, going on there. A couple years later, when we got Dr. Gupta more involved, you guys came along, Canadian MPN Network, you're on Twitter now. We've got Patient Power. You've got the MPN Advocacy Groups, MPN RF, Research Foundation. You've got pharmaceutical companies. Most of us thought leaders are now on Twitter. Amazing. So you're talking about real-time engagement, talking about patient care, quality of life, difficult uh, questions in the clinic, 
research findings. This has transformed the way I approach my life, my career, the way I think about referrals and clinical trials, and it increases awareness in a rare disease space where we don't have a ribbon, we don't have a race. Most people have never heard about our disease outside of our community. Game changing. And there's other forms of social media coming out now as well. We uh, were able to build on these efforts. And because of, unfortunately, because of the extended pandemic time, we haven't all been able to meet together now for two years. And so we co-founded Dr. Mesa Verstovsik and I, the Texas MPN a workshop, where we were able to get speakers from around the world, Dr. Gupta, um, others from uh, Europe and, and elsewhere to join us. And this was a very successful event. So we hope you join us for the third annual meeting next year, which we'll try to do as a hybrid. So in person, if, if and when it's safe to do that, with a virtual component. I think the key for the patient journey is to have free registration, open meetings like this, where anybody who has a stake holding uh, you know, capability can join. So with that, I'm right on time. I'd like to thank all of you and the Canadian MPN Network, Dr. Vikas Gupta and your team for not only inviting me, but for the great life-saving work you're doing for all the patients. And I'd like to invite you to follow me on social media at Dr. Pem on Twitter, follow our conversations, hashtag MPNSM, and really thank so many of my colleagues who have been instrumental to uh, my work and my team's work. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you for a Q&A. Thank you. Wow, such a great talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Pemaraju. You are Thank so you. inspirational. Absolutely excellent, excellent information for our community, our Canadian folks to uh, know and understand. And, and what you speak about, the quality of life, that has been the impetus behind our project with the Canadian MPN Research right. Foundation. And we hope to engage with you as well as not only our Canadian doctors, but other doctors around the world to get your thoughts once our app is up and going, because patient reported outcomes are so vitally important uh, to their physicians and to the research community. It's really going to be, um, I believe, the future, as you call it, of uh, treating MPNs and how we can personalize that medicine and treat each MPN patient, I don't want to say individually, but with more precise uh, medication well said. for them. So Beautiful. definitely, thank you very much. And we look forward to um, engaging with you on that project as we move it forward. So we do have a couple of questions here Great. that have come through our chat. The first one is, is does the type of blood you have affect the progression of myelofibrosis? And does your blood type predispose you to this disease? Great question. And so I think they're just talking about our the standard blood type that we all have, right? So A, B, O, these, these type of blood types. This comes up frequently in the clinic. Amazingly, that doesn't have a lot of impact on the day-to-day -day, uh, MPN. So the good news is no matter what blood type you are, you know, these drugs work, the, the responses are the same. There are some studies you'll see that some blood types may be susceptible to some, uh, you know, immune type situations. And then also when you're going for a stem cell transplant, people, a lot of my patients think that it's the standard blood typing that matters, but it's actually a whole different typing called HLA. And that's something that's not available usually. So I guess in a good sense, because I know some people are worried that, oh, I have a rare blood type, I'm AB or O or something. That, the good news is that doesn't affect your day-to-day -day MPN therapy. Uh, and as we're seeing in this COVID pandemic, if I may take the moment to say, even at our center and everywhere around the world, there's blood shortages in a pandemic. So definitely if you're, uh, you know, for, for those of you who are healthy and are able to, you know, not our patients, but whoever can, you know, that's why we need to have blood on hand so that we can give blood to those who need it. Excellent. Absolutely. I can tell you I'm one of those people because I Thank know you. from my late husband who is transfusion dependent, um, you know, what it took to get a bag of blood for him. Yes, so God bless you. Thank you. Uh, both my sons and myself are, uh, wow. are contributors to donating blood because we know the importance wow. of it. So our next question is, is one of the most problematic side effects of Jacobi. Uh, mm. Here in Canada, we say Jacobi, not Jacobi. Ah, yes, right. Uh, yes, thank but you. <laughs> seems to be weight gain for our yes. case. Is this common or uncommon amongst Jacobi users? And thank you for any insight that you might uh, give. Great question. And we need to put it in all these talks. Absolutely. Yes. The questioner is correct. It is actually a very common 
Uh, I'll call it a side effect, but of course I'll put that caveat on that. In PV and ET patients, oftentimes this is an undesirable, if you will, because most of our PV and ET patients, most, um, are not necessarily suffering from the cachexian weight loss, but then the flip side is, is, is the case in myelofibrosis. Many of our patients with MF actually have weight loss, cachectic, not feeling well, nutrition deficient, and there the weight gain uh, might be desirable. So weight gain is common with Jacophy. It's a sort of off-target, known mechanistic thing. My colleagues in New York, led by Dr. Joe Scandura, Dr. Silver and colleagues uh, in New York have really done some nice studies and, and you should check that out. There's some concept that perhaps the ruxolitinib as it's working can go through some of these uh, adipose tissue, fat cell pathways, leptin and all, all of that stuff. But, but, the, but the concept here is that the weight gain can be real. If you are healthy enough and you have one of the earlier diseases, talk to your doctor about you know, weight loss program, exercise, diet, of course, watching the cholesterol, and then again, of course, if you're with MF and you were sick before, this may actually be a desirable side effect of the drug. Absolutely. Our third question here is, does Jacovy cause the same sores that you've shown with hydroxyurea? Now, having skin cancer since the beginning of Jacovy, um, mainly on the lower legs. So important. any comment that you have on that? Very important. And, and it's so great that this was asked because even for us in the clinic, we're starting to recognize this. So the short answer is yes to all. I think that all MPN patients are going to require a dermatologist at some point. That's basically what's happening. Hydroxyurea causes ulcers, as they ask nicely. So squamous cell cancer, skin cancers, breakdown of the skin. But also the Jacophy, ruxolitinib, as great of a drug as it is, can also lead to non-melanoma skin cancer, squamous cell, basal cell, all of this. I would say that the ulcers and breakdown are different. You don't commonly see that with the ruxolitinib, but you do see the skin signal. So this appears to be something that's part of our field. Many of our patients are also older, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. So many, many of you may have a dermatologist already, but make no mistake about it. This appears to be common among MPN patients, at least these non-melanoma skin cancers. Melanoma, we'll say, is a whole different, you know, malignant cancer that has to be treated different. But I would recommend that we all start thinking about having a, perhaps a dermatologist involved yearly dermatology consult. And then when some skin lesion pops up, get it checked out, get it seen, biopsy, don't delay. So skin care is important. And now we recognize that. Excellent. Uh, another question that's just come through to us is that you mentioned interferon can cause autoimmune hmm. problems. What are your thoughts on patients with thyroid issues using interferons for Oof. their MPN? Wow, this is great. This is just uh, called Wednesday in our clinic, right? These are the important questions you guys are asking. So a couple of things to say. Yes to everything again here. So interferon, no matter what formulation, and I, I didn't mention the brand new formulation that our colleagues, Dr. Gissinger and Jean-Jacques Kalagian in France and Austria have pioneered called a ROPEG interferon, trade name Bezrimi, which is actually approved in the EU and hopefully will bring here to the United States and, and Canada one day. So no matter what formulation of interferon, autoimmune side effects are part of the deal. Number two, the mo one of the most, if not the most common is autoimmune thyroiditis, exactly as the questioner is asking. And it's actually, these are common conditions in the general population actually. So thyroid issues, autoimmune thyroiditis. All of this is general advice. You guys know the caveat is for your specific condition, you have to talk to your oncologist, your doctor, your endocrinologist. But in general, the answer is yes, you can have patients with low grade um, conditions that are well controlled, and then you're really following the interferon therapy with reduced doses, close consultation with endocrinologists, maximizing with the thyroid medicine. So it's not necessarily a complete contraindication. The problem is the reverse, which is you don't have it before. Now you get the Pegasus, and then you have a rip roaring case of autoimmune something. That's actually more difficult. And there you may not be able to continue on your interferon. So we'll at least answer the question to say that this does occur commonly. There may be some ways if you work with the multidisciplinary team, but you also don't wanna push it, right? So if the interferon is continuing to exacerbate the autoimmune condition, maybe interferon is not for you and you need to check that out with your doctor. Wonderful, thank you. So our next question is, is we always hear that ET doesn't affect lifespan, but is that the case for younger people? Ooh, great. 
We don't know. So I did one of the larger studies here with uh, Serge Rostovsek uh, called MPN AYA Adolescent Young Adult Retrospective Review. We found two things to our surprise. One is that 10, uh, 10, 11%, so a good, pretty decent part of our referrals here at the MD Anderson are young patients below the age of 40 with MPN. Of course, we're a world referral center, so that might be more than most. So a lot of young people, and two, young people oftentimes have very, very unique, rare, and difficult circumstances. For example, a young person um, may have a headache found to have a blood clot called a dural or cerebral uh, venous thrombosis. That's unusual. And then a workup is done and then a JAK2 or a CalR is found, boom. Then the patient, you come to find out they have ET or PV. So completely the reverse of what we were doing a generation ago. Number two, so a young person comes in for a knee surgery or some routine surgery. They do pre-op CBC, up oh, your blood count is off, go see a hematologist. Oh my goodness, you have P vera, that's the diagnosis. So you're getting people diagnosed younger and younger because people interface with the health system more frequently than they did a generation or two ago. So in this setting, my study and all the other ones around the world don't have that long a follow-up. So if you're a young person who's diagnosed with ETPV in your 20s and 30s, we can extrapolate that you'll have a normal life expectancy. But the questioner is right. Most of those studies that were done, including the Italian study, the median age is much older, more like a real world 60s and 70s kind of an age. So I would say if you're a young person with MPN, I have three strategies for you. One, 100% in addition to your local doctor, I would definitely be referred to or seek a second opinion in an academic center, just so you have that sort of perspective. Number two, is therapies and drugs that are usually tested in older patients may not have the same dosing or the same schedule. So you wanna check that out, particularly for the teenage patients who are closer to pediatric than adults. And then three, the psychosocial components, fertility, pregnancy, logistics, adherence, insurance are markedly different for our young patients than our older patients. Even something simple, and of course, this is a difference between US and Canadian systems, as you'll appreciate, insurance and losing the insurance, that's a big deal here in the state. So make sure you have sort of a multidisciplinary team to help you with the life journey as well as the disease journey. Absolutely. I know a lot of hematologists um, get the question that they're not the general practitioner, that the MPN patient really needs to make sure that they have the team of practitioners, of healthcare physicians right. um, and healthcare practitioners working together, that the hematologist is really there about their blood, but the general practitioner is someone who needs to look at the other things happening. And that's one of the things that um, in Canada we would really like to do is get the awareness out to the general practitioner community about MPNs, because so many of them don't know know much about the MPN blood cancers. Right. We really want to educate that greater community. So that's certainly on our radar to do here in Canada. So a couple more questions and just, um, you know, making sure that we're on time and cognizant of your time as well. Um, if we don't get to your question that you've posed, please know that we will have Dr. Pramaraju and Dr. Surhan. Um, we'll reach out to them by email. We'll get them to answer the questions by email and then we'll post those answers on our website, definitely. So we have a little bit of time here for just a couple more questions. Um, and another question we have here is weight loss due mainly to muscle mass loss or to the lack of food? Ah, that's an important question, actually. So I would say both. Um, so let's, let's focus on the myelofibrosis because that's what the questioner is likely asking about, right? So in the early stages of myelofibrosis, it's the hepatosplenomegaly, so the large spleen and liver um, physically either causing discomfort or pain for the patients. And then therefore you're not able to eat as much. You're not able to take in as much. That's this early satiety abdominal discomfort thing that we talked about. But in some of our patients, as the disease course goes on, as you get sicker, as it gets later, then the reverse happens, which is now you're not exercising as much. You're not moving around as much. You might become not necessarily bed bound, but you're taking naps during the day, fatigued, your nutrition is getting lower. Now then you can start to have real muscle loss. So it's actually, unfortunately, a vicious cycle. That's what I think the JAK inhibitors were such a game changer for us because in addition to shrinking the physical part, the spleen, decreasing the cytokine storm, 
now people are starting to feel better as well. And then now what do you do? Now you're going to eat a little bit better, eat a little bit more. Now you're going to see the weight gain. So it's kind of related to what we were talking about earlier. Excellent. Um, a f- last question that we have, and again, you know, wonderful that you've been asking all these questions, but again, we just want to be really conscious of our time. Um, but the last question we have here is for ET healthy 60 plus patients, um, at what platelet level do you start cytoreduction reduction treatment? And what do you think of interferon as a first line drug? This is for ET, right? Yes. Yes. Good. Yeah. So, right. So I mentioned it briefly. So great questions. Number one, interesting. I didn't mention it because the platelet count comes up a lot, right? In the clinic. So the textbook answer is that we don't really look at the number. Now, if the platelet goes super high, so most people get nervous around a million, but really around 1.5 million is kind of the answer. So when it gets that high, you would think you're at risk for clotting. Uh Uh-huh, not necessarily. The clotting and platelet number don't track even though you intuitively think they would. In fact, when the platelets get 1.5 million or higher, you're actually at risk for bleeding. There is a reason for that. It's called acquired von Willebrand state. But the concept is if your platelets are that uh, high, then they can be fragile, sticky, touching each other, and you can actually bleed. So in that situation, the platelet number matters. Likely your doctor will ask you to hold your blood thinning agent, check some labs. And if you're actively bleeding, you may actually need to be admitted to the hospital in that setting. Now, short of that, for most of you out there, there's no magic number. I know you want me to say that, but there's no number. There's no 800, 700, 500. Sometimes people get nervous, either patients or providers or both, but it really should be based on the factors we talked about. Cytoreductive therapy, should be based on age greater than 60. That's because over age 60, for any of us, we're at a higher risk of blood clot, period. And then number two, it should be based on, you know, this concept, if you had a prior blood clot, regardless of age. So if you're 22, you have ET, you had a prior blood clot, that's an indication for cytoreductive therapy. And the reason is our studies show that cytoreductive therapy decreases your chance of a subsequent or a first blood clot, period. There you go. Lastly, what I would say is front first line in the US at least, you have two choices, either hydroxyurea or interferon. Most of us are using the Pegasus or pegylated interferon. There are two trials that have gone head to head uh, to try to answer this question. Those are ongoing trials. Uh, There's no major answer yet. So it's your choice, but they're so different. I I have a really long initial discussion with with my patients, right? Interferon, as we talked about, is an injectable. It has certain side effects needs to be monitored. If you have a certain history of autoimmune, depression, psych history, you may not be able to qualify. Hydroxyurea is convenient. It's easy. It's there. It's pills, but it has its own side effect profile. And then let's put a plug in for clinical trial. If you happen to be at a place where you can go on a clinical trial, that would be something that to always consider because that may uh, give you something different or more than the standard of care. Excellent, excellent. And so our very last question here is um, comes to us, and it's uh, why not using why not use a JAK inhibitor to treat ET, uh, for example, instead of hydroxyurea. With hydroxyurea, we don't go to the bottom of the problem, right. and one needs to up the dosage. What are your thoughts right. on that? Correct, correct. Yeah. So we actually tried that. The reason why I didn't make it here is it didn't didn't yet get FDA approval. So there were two nice studies. Uh, Professor Claire Harrison and Verstovsik led them, MAGIC study and others, which I would tell you in layman's terms showed kind of a mixed result. So um, the concept with ET is you didn't have the same nice primary endpoint data that you saw with P-Vera. So ET is a little bit tougher to show what are you actually trying to reduce for the patient. If you have symptoms, fine. Maybe if you have a super high white count, and then of course, I guess this platelet count per se, So the endpoints in ET, we as a field still need to think about what's going to benefit you as a patient. And then you have to worry about toxicity, right? Because many of our patients with ET do live a fairly normal life expectancy. So there, you don't want to put up with as much toxicity and and side effects as you would say in myelofibrosis. So the answer to your question is yes, we did try RUCs in clinical trials in ET, mixed responses so far. So the jury's still out, more investigation is needed. Excellent, excellent. So just in closing, um, Dr. Primaraju, what are your last words of wisdom to give to our patients? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, hope, inspiration, knowledge, and education is my mantra. Wow. Um, You know, what what do you have? um, Yeah, you couldn't couldn't have said it better than that. (laughs) 
I, first of all, this was an extraordinarily stimulating question and answer session. So you should know that this was, these were awesome questions. So thank you all. Yeah, I would leave with this. I would say two things. One, I would say it's your body. It's your choice. Never feel bad about asking a question in the clinic. Never apologize to ask your nurse, your doctor, anyone for a question. You know that concept, there's no stupid questions. That's right. In other words, it's your body. You deserve and you have the right and the ability to ask questions. And if you don't have a healthcare provider team that's doing that, guess what? You have the option to switch and go to another provider. Okay, so that's number one. It's your body, it's your life, your choice. Never feel bad about researching. The only thing I would ask you to do is research. I want you to look on Google, look up things on Twitter, but don't keep it in isolation because what applies to one patient or patient group may not apply to you. Just bring it to your next visit. Talk about it with your team. Okay. Number two, I will say, if you build it, they will come, which is for those of us, you and us, all of us who deal with super rare diseases, because let's face it, this is still considered a rare disease that we shall not and will not wait for others to get interested in our disease. But if we build it, they will come. In other words, rare diseases are only rare to the general population, not rare to you or your wife or your husband or your loved one. That's your disease. That's what you're dealing with. And you should know that there's people like me, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Mesa, people who are dedicating their lives and careers to it. So what I would tell you at the end of the day, it's not a rare disease to me or to my team. It's a disease that you and your family are facing, and we will not quit or rest until we help you out. Oh my gosh, so inspirational. Absolutely, thank you very, very much. Well, on behalf of the over 75 patients that have joined us today uh, from across Canada, coast to coast to coast, um, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you so very much for um, coming and talking with us and providing your insights. Um, You know, it's always so great to hear you talk. I've heard you talk at um, the American Society of Hematology and at, uh, you know, certain I've been to, for those people that don't know what ASH and EHA stand for, the European Society of Hematology or the European Hematology Association and the uh, American Society of Hematology, um, you know, absolutely, you're very inspiring, have always wow. been a favorite of mine to hear talk. And I do follow you on Twitter and uh, certainly try and engage when I can. So awesome. thank you so very thank much you. for attending with us today. I and I will reach out with the rest of our questions uh, via do. email and uh, look forward to being able to put those on our website uh, to answer our folks. So thank you very, thank very you much. Thank you so much. Again. So it's long, everyone. Pleasure. What All a right. warm. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. All Take right. Take care. Thank you Bye-bye. so much. Bye.